last time we talked, we talked about the situation with, uh, or we ran through some different examples of restoration. Um, now I want to take us through some approaches to trying to go larger. Um, these are not lectures about large-scale restorations per se, but this is, this is an example of how we might be able to go from smaller scale to larger scale. So we run through three different examples. Um, ultimately, we all want to do large-scale restoration, have large-scale chunks of area uh, you know, healed and recovering more fully. Um, but oftentimes, the parts that we're left with, especially in places like uh, urbanized Southern California, the parts we're left with are relatively small parts. One. Two, the funding we have available is relatively small. So we, 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 can't <clears throat> we maybe can't you know, do miles and miles and miles and miles of areas from the get-go. So you will find yourself, more often than not, working on relatively small, small chunks of land, as we saw with the Ojai uh, Meadows Reserve, et cetera. You can start small and you can, you can phase up. So let's talk about how we might go about um, scaling up restoration projects. Um, as a reminder, this is a, a figure from one of our earlier lectures, just this notion of, um, in this case, this is, this is old data, but this is wetland uh, success, restoration success in Florida. And the key point here is, whatever our metric is, generally speaking, we rarely get full success, right? So usually what we do is better than nothing, but we don't often hit, every, hit um, on all cylinders every single time. So one thing we can talk about when we do a, a phased type of an approach is one, it allows us to look at the methodological, uh, tech, the techniques we're actually going to use to do the restoration. Two, it allows us to um, hone or fine tune our evaluation skills. And then third, it's, it oftentimes is a really key place to have exchange. In terms of the methodology, I'm a big proponent of doing restoration as a series of phased experiments. Now, I'm an academic, I'm a nerdy professor, so I have the luxury of thinking about that. A lot of consultants don't have that luxury, but, but when we can, I think it promotes, it generally promotes long-term success if we take a phased experimental approach to restoration. Throughout that, we don't just get a little bit larger, a little bit larger, but we can actually go up to uh, orders of magnitude greater extent from phase one to phase two to phase three. So we can have quite large uh, expanding scales, but that also applies to temporal scales as well as spatial scales. In terms of evaluation, it allows us to, if we don't currently have indicators of ecological functioning and restoration success, it allows us to um, hone those or fine tune those to the particular environment, the particular geography, uh, where our restoration might be occurring. And related to that, it might allow us to develop a network of reference sites. And as we'll talk about, um, especially in heavily degraded, fragmented areas, you really do need a network of reference sites. Just picking one reference site, which is the old sort of theoretical approach, pick the healthy forest site and compare it to your forest. We rarely have a super kick butt healthy forest site now. We have to have a network of sites try to piece together what we might think would be a high level of ecological functioning. And then in terms of facilitating exchange, uh, that, that um, this still exists. It's getting much better. It's getting much better. But there historically is this divide in at least academia, traditional ecological research, between the so-called quote-unquote basic research and the quote-unquote applied side. Restoration is a place where those folks can very clearly come together. If the basic scientists really truly understand things the way they claim they do, they should be able to piece together the jigsaw puzzle, right? And, and applied folks, practitioner folks, benefit from some of the perspective and theory, uh, et cetera, that, that um, the folks from the more quote unquote basic science realm um, bring. And so, so a, a very important way to exchange talk. Again, this is getting better, but um, this has been a problem in the past. Uh, in terms of academic research. And, and related to that is also the, the university scientist person better interacting with the practitioner consultant world person. And that, uh, that's gotten much, much better in the last many years. Okay, so we're going to talk about three different examples today 
of some restorations that I've done. One is right out here, right, you just a five minute drive from campus, the Magoo Lagoon uh, Salt Pond Restoration. Then we'll talk about some of our grassland restoration, and then we'll talk about some restoration work uh, most recently we've been doing in Turkey. Uh, so uh, we'll touch, we'll go into more depth on all these, but real quickly, Magoo is going to deal with ecotoxicology. Toxicology is the study of poisons. Ecotoxicology is the study of poisons on things other than just humans. So toxicology traditionally just focuses on on human response to those poisons. Ecotoxicology looks at uh, includes that, but also includes what that does to non human organisms as well as the ecosystem. So we had ecotoxicological concerns there with some, some heavy metals and some issues related to toxicity. And so there we, um, we, the main approach was to see if we could use some potentially toxic sediment in our restoration. In the grassland experiment at Stanford, we have the massive challenge in California of our grasslands being dominated by European and Asian grasses and our native grass species, uh, but a small sliver of what's there, what's remaining. And so a lot of the approach that, we, that I took there was to evaluate different seed mixes and see what, you know, what blend would be best, et cetera, and also work on different invas invasion suppression techniques. In Turkey, we basically have, <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of problems in Turkey right now, but suffice to say, we didn't have any, we had very little money um, initially, when we began, zero local capacity and uh, a huge issue with uh, government corruption and, and nepotism and things of that nature. And so there, it was really about testing restoration as an idea, not even necessarily a particular method, but this whole thing was foreign to uh, folks in the area. So th the very notion of restoration as a thing to do, and then uh, trying to build an, an ethic or an, an an ethos to uh, uh, have people worry about the environment or consider the environment um, from the get-go. So wholesale, a very, very, very challenging situation in uh, Turkey. So let's start talking about our salt marsh restoration project first. You guys know where this is, just down the road, right, Magoo Lagoon, bounded now by um, uh, PCH, which is shown right here. Right, PCA. Here's Cayugas Creek, our creek that runs by campus and and uh, into Magoo. This is we call this area the central basin of Magoo. This this part right here, we call this the eastern arm, and then over here where the airport and stuff is, we call that the western arm. This is the central basin. You can see we talked about this before about the history of this changed. Uh, um, geomorphology, etc. But long story short, this is the main focus of what we we're interested in for our restoration. This is an old picture. This picture is from about 1996. And this is showing um, the ponds at full functioning. More about those in a second. Here's the same uh, area, this time from up on Magoo Peak where we've driven and we're looking back down towards the base. Um, and uh, right, so this is what brought us to Magoo the first time. Different era when the base went in. The base was the, the, the bulk of the base was constructed in the in the late 40s, early 50s. One of the biggest challenges we have with restoration, as we've talked about before, is getting the historical information. What was here before? What's what, what were the species that were here before? What was the activity that was going on here before, et cetera? And as you guys know, a lot of times you have to wing it. You have to do best guess because those records maybe just don't exist. At a military base, one of the potential advantages is it's a military base, right? So they love to write everything down. They love to write how what time you get up in the morning and what time how much food you ate and how quickly the rotation on the engines are, all that stuff. Uh, surprisingly. <laughs> They didn't keep records on when they created the sewage ponds, so we don't actually know. So we went to everything in, in terms of trying to find old people that worked at the base and just oral history type approach. Couldn't ever nail this down. Best guess, this, these, these sewage ponds probably were established in the early 1950s, but it's, it's, they were there by the late 50s. They weren't there in the mid 40s. So, so sometime in there, these went in. 
What was this? Again, let's remember wetlands, stinky, bad, ugly places. And, um, you know, unused, wasted. So what folks did, and, and so we have a growing base, right? We have maybe 20,000 people on base <laughs> or so today, right? With contractors and, and folks uh, not necessarily living there, but at least working there in the daylight hours. Um, although a large proportion of folks do actually live on base as well. And uh, they got their waste stream needs to go somewhere. So for many years, what the, the answer was, hey, I know, put the poop in the marsh, because why not, right? So the main part of the base is right up here, right? So they, and here's a, a major boulevard. So we built a bridge across here. Now, when I first started this bridge, you could actually drive across. If you guys have been there, you know that now it's only a walking bridge because El Nino basically took the bridge out one year. Um, and so here, here's a bridge over here. And then on the side, you'll notice there's some, there's some things here. Those are pipes. So that pipe would bring sewage from the, the homes and the, and the waste stream of the base and go through a very little bit of filtering, basically take the chunks out, essentially. And then the raw sewage was basically dumped into these series of sewage ponds, settling ponds. Because we don't know how these ponds were created, we don't, we don't, we can't say exactly how they were built. However, in the in the doing of the restoration, when I was running the field crews and and climbing down in the mud and all that stuff, it seems pretty clear that what they did was they took tractors out into this part. So again, this was part of the central basin, um, and they just put the blade down and drove and just cleared the area of vegetation, etc. These edges, there's a series of cells here, but the, the, the edges are uh, basically rock, big boulders. So they came and dumped a bunch of rock, maybe sand, very, very really, really sandy, and, and essentially stuck the rock there and shoved the, the sediment from the surface of the marsh and or sand and just build it up, and that was it. That was it. They may have taken some clay and put it on the bottom after they were done driving around to create a, a, a something of a, of a clay layer of a, of, a, of a capturing device. Maybe. That's it. And that was going on for a couple decades. So when we got involved in the mid-90s, the estimates were water or liquid from this, this perimeter of this pond was leaking out at the rate of about 100,000 gallons a day into the marsh, in, into, into the surrounding area. That's a lot of, uh, that's a major, you know, hydrological source for this, for this wetland. Um, here's what it looks like when we started. So I, this, this uh, looks great, smells great, good times. Um, and, uh, and so basically what was happening was, you can't do that. You can't just pump poop into the wetland and just say we're good to go. So folks started raising concern, and, and essentially by the mid-90s, the decision was, hey, we shouldn't be doing this anymore. So then what they did was construct a pipe, a sewage pipe, to the city of Oxnard. Now all the base waste is taken to the municipal treatment plant in Oxnard and treated as it, as it should be, like the rest of our waste stream, more responsibly. Um, so that's great. But now they had this, now they essentially had, by 96, they had this uh, you know, abandoned sewage pond area. So now it would accumulate, in this case, it would accumulate runoff, or excuse me, not runoff, but, but rainfall. Uh, I should say this is a large area, this is 32 acres. So this is a pretty good chunk of, chunk of land, particularly, particularly a good, a good chunk of land that's potential salt marsh in the middle of one of our last remnant large salt marshes. So, oh my God, it's a no-brainer, let's restore it, right? However, before we start to do that, the, the military went and took some samples um, in that sludge and they found this. They found uh, n no real organics to speak of, no D not a lot of DDT, anything like that. But there were four heavy metals that we either at or approaching the problematic level. <coughs> So the, the, the presence of these, these contaminants 
make the waste classified as non-hazardous sewage sludge. Now when I came into this, non-hazardous sewage sludge, that's cool, it's non-hazardous. No, that's not good. That's better than hazardous sewage sludge. Hazardous sewage sludge is when it's glowing with radiation and stuff like that, right? So non-hazardous is not ideal. So non-hazardous still has to be disposed of. Non-hazardous is considered material that should not be allowed in place. Um, so what the Navy was looking at having to do is scoop this entire 30-odd acre area of sludge, of the remnant sludge, and take it to a, 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 a low-level hazardous disposal site. Big hole in the ground would be left, and that's it. No mandate to necessarily restore, just dig out this area. That would have been super expensive. Unclear how expensive, but on the order of tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars, at least. What are the units that this is? Um, I think these are parts per million, I think. Parts per million? I think. Thousands? I think it's parts per million. Yeah, right, exactly. So, at the time, Still, this is still the case, but at the time, a lot of the restoration had been done in Southern California, had been done by some of our, for example, colleagues down at San Diego State, and they typically used, uh, and other restoration folks used whatever sediment was around. Oftentimes, that was sand. Oftentimes, that was large-grained stuff. So that means that it wasn't really silty, wasn't really clay. And we tend to have really, really poor performing plant communities in our salt marsh restorations in the 80s and early 90s. So uh, one of the recommendations was, hey, make sure you have enough organics in the soil. Make sure you have enough nutrients, et cetera. Here, we had poop. We had sludge. That should be an advantage, right, that other folks didn't necessarily have. However, we have the downside of toxicity. So the advantages of thinking about maybe somehow incorporating the sludge into the restoration are one, first and foremost, it would allow us to restore the place. Because the Navy wasn't necessarily required to do it otherwise. So if we somehow used it in place, instead of having to haul it off, that would by definition be guaranteeing the Navy would become invested in wetland restoration. Okay. Number two, as I mentioned, uh, this sludge is relatively nutrient rich, right? It's fertilizer, basically. So, that, so the problem of making sure the plants have enough nutrients to grow, that, that's we kind of take care of that, at least to an extent. On a logistic side, we don't have any disposal costs, right? So that is tens and tens of millions of dollars can go into restoration. No, they won't, right? It doesn't work that way. But at least, at least um, we avoid that cost. And the trade-off is maybe they'll give us a fraction of that money they otherwise would spend for the restoration, a non-trivial concern. And then lastly, for stuff that we care about, that would have been tens of thousands of trucks, of, of dump trucks, going from here to, at the, at the time, the, the naval, the, the disposal site for this type of stuff for the, for the DOD was in, it was either Utah or Nevada, I can't remember, but we had to, we had to ship it to another state, basically, right? All that air pollution, all that uh, fuel consumption, right? So if we can use the sludge somehow, we can avoid all those transportation, et cetera, impacts. Clearly, the worry is, well, if we use this <coughs> material in our wetland, it might be bad for the critters in the wetland. Maybe we have these metals and stuff, that's, that's bad, right? So maybe we'll be poisoning our, our guys that live here. One, two. Maybe that poison, because we're talking about making this a more connected marsh, healthy wetland, instead of contained in these ponds, we're going to be breaking down to an extent the walls of the ponds. Maybe we'll be letting that poison out as well. So maybe we'll be poisoning guys right here. Maybe we'll be poisoning the rest of the marsh or other areas. So those are the potential advantages and disadvantages. Everybody cool? So again, the challenges were um, were the outright talk potential toxicity of the sludge. Two, you can't just take this stuff and put it out in a wetland. That doesn't work, 
right? There's federal laws, state laws about releasing essentially poison into the environment. So we had to get a lot of waivers, many, many waivers. We, had, we spent a lot of time in meetings and, and, and talking with different you know, guys from the EPA, et cetera, <clears throat> to, to allow us to even try to start to do this. And then again, thirdly, uh, especially back then, we really were still figuring out how to do salt marsh restoration. So there's you know, exactly how we should go about doing this. What's the most optimal way to restore these sites? So this is what we proposed, and, and this is what we got approved by the regulatory agencies. We said, here, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a series of phase approaches. We're going to start very small, small spatial and temporal scales, and we'll make sure the stuff isn't totally toxic and isn't going to kill things, right? And if that goes okay, we'll go to a slightly bigger scale, slightly larger area, slightly longer time, and then if that goes, you know, et cetera. So in this case, the phased experiment, the phased approach to restoration, to the phased approach to scaling up was central to being able to do the restoration. If we'd not done it this way, there's no, we, we could not have done it. So just to give you guys a sense of what was going on, the first phase was essentially one experiment involving 280 plants that went for just a bit over a year and it was the si scale of the size of a one gallon pot, planting pot. Uh, phase two was what we call the pilot restoration. And that was, uh, you'll see that, that, that's a series of experiments. And that was gonna go for a couple of years. That's on the order of one hectare and, and tens of thousands of plants. Actually, well, like, I think it was like 12,000 or something, but you know, a lot of plants. And then phase three and four were larger and larger scales. So let's talk about what this place looks like to start with. So um, this is on the upper right. This is what the sludge looked like when we started. So right, we'd cut off, we cut off new additional input of, of waste into the system for a while uh, by the time we started this. So this, this looks like uh, kind of like moon rocks, you know, sort of, sort of uh, a lot of fissures. <clears throat> if you look over on the left, you can see one of the reasons why we think there might have been a clay lens under, well, there clearly was a clay layer underneath the sludge. So this is, this is, this is some, you know, uh, here, here's the sludge essentially, and it's, you know, several feet thick, and then we get to this clay-like layer, right? And then it's pretty much homogeneous, old school wetland sediment below here. So if this, this wasn't intentionally put down, it somehow accumulated or what have you. Um, it wasn't consistently laid down, so it wasn't homogeneous. It wasn't a perfect uh, clay layering, if, if it indeed was, but there's definitely clay uh, underlying the sludge. And then this is, let's see, this is me. This is my PhD advisor. This is a lady who now runs a consulting firm uh, in Southern California, and this is uh, a friend of mine who now is a big mucky muck in the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is us shoveling. So I literally shoveled shit for my PhD. So, so I, I both figuratively and literally. So this was this was awesome. Um, you can ask me more details, ugly, gruesome details later if you want. Okay. So the first question was pot experiment. Basic idea here is, hey, can we take this sludge, dilute it with clean sediment? And take the toxicity, take take the potential toxicity away, or 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 vastly reduce it, but also get the benefit of the fertilizing aspect of the sludge. Can we do that? That's the basic idea. And if we could, we could just go to the sewage ponds and and you know mix it all up and have them all good to go, and 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 have the sediment in place, right? Not have to move it around with trucks and stuff. So the first thing to do that was this pot experiment. So this part, you'll notice these, I had a, we had a relatively wet and relatively dry site. So we had two sites. And these are just outside the pond. So these are actually in what you would otherwise consider to be pristine, healthy salt marsh. Also, I got to call it the pot experiment, <laughs> which uh, we've actually published a paper on this where we talk about the pot experiment. So um, uh, that was pretty cool. OK, so here are the questions. Questions are, number one, does sludge harm the plants? 
Number two, does it benefit them at all? And then assuming that it do, isn't totally toxic and it, it does at least give them some kind of benefit, um, is there an optimal, is there an ideal mix of sludge to, to clean soil? Okay. So this is what we did. So that's me again, digging and digging and digging. So we, I, went, I went in and I cleared out the vegetation, cut away all the plants, and created essentially a little mini farm, a little mini, mini farm plot, actually two of them, in the salt marsh. So here I'm cleaning everything. And then once I've cleared everything, um, I've gone in and I've cut out, and that's what I'm doing right here, I've, I've cut out little holes and I've taken a pot, a one gallon pot. Taken the soils and I've put different mixtures, 50, 50, et cetera. Put the soil, uh, or, excuse me, yeah, put, put that new mixture in the pot and then sunk that pot into the ground. Each one of these pots had 64 different holes, drill holes drilled into it. So water can go in, water can go out just like it otherwise would with the soil but it, it kept all of the soil contained. The idea here being that when we're done, we can pull the pots out of, this, out, of this, out of the marsh, and yes, there might be a little bit of soil might dribble out, but by and large, we could remove all the toxicity. Uh, if, there was, if, there was, if it was poisonous soil, we could pull most of it out, right? So that's what allowed the EPA and others to give us the waiver to go ahead and do this. Um, in addition to just, and so again, uh, various mixtures of of sludge to other stuff. You'll also notice if you look close, here's a pot sunk to the ground, here's a pot sunk into the ground, here is just dirt. So we also have procedural controls. So we have a few controls where we actually put just the soil straight into the uh, sediment. And then we planted the two most common community dominant species in there. So Salicornia and Frankenia. So, so one individual plant was planted into each pot. Cool? Everybody with me? All right. And this is what we saw. Again, recall we had a relatively dry site, a rel which is a little bit higher, relatively wet site that had much more uh, standing water, et cetera, throughout the year. And this is what we see. Let me orient you to this. So, this is, so, so the, the plants did their due, they grew, and at the end of the experiment, we pulled this up. Actually, a, a guy cut me off on PCH and almost killed me. So I, my, my van, my poor van died in the process of this experiment, but I didn't, and <laughs> the, the other guy didn't. But, um, but uh, when the accident happened, I had, all, I had a large chunk of this biomass in the back of my van, oh. and, and they're like, you gotta, it, no, no, sorry, plant biomass, <laughs> not sludge biomass, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry plant biomass. And when they were doing something, like, gotta save the plants, and people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we're towing it to the impound, you're like, no, you can't tow the impound, there's, there's dead stems back there. They're like, what? This guy's got a concussion or something. <laughs> Anywho, so here we go. So, so this is, so this is um, okay, so this is looking at the above ground biomass. So all the individuals have been snipped right at the, right at the interface where, where the stem comes out of the soil, individually bagged, and then taken back, dried, and then weighed. And so what we're looking at here, this, in this case, this is salicornia, our pickleweed. This is dry weight. And this is the different mixtures we had. So 0% sludge to the maximum we calculated was 70% sludge because we calculated if we went above that, we would be into the prop potentially legally problematic levels. So all these, these dilutions brought us into what were considered non-toxic levels of these uh, materials. Okay, so we have uh, our wet site is in light green, our dry site's in dark green. These are means and standard errors. So these are all uh, in pots, 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 pots. This was actually wetland soil. So when I dug out the, the holes, I, I saved some of that soil. And, this, and then I used that. So that, that's the most ideal. That, that's the primo soil, right? It's the best we could possibly have. That's where the plants are growing now. So I, I did that. And then again, there, I mentioned there's a procedural control where we didn't have a pot. And so I did that with the wetland soil so that um, if there was a problem, we wouldn't have to dig out, you know, I could leave that in place af at the end of the experiment. Okay. And what, what pattern do you guys see? Less sludge better for the wet sites. Uh, right. L yeah. So, so um, it looks like 
Well, okay, so, so one observation was less sludge is better, maybe. Uh, turns out none of those were statistically significantly different. None of these, none of, say, the light green bars here were statistically significantly different from one another. But compared to wetland soils, right, you're right. In general, our mixtures, plants didn't do as well in those treatments relative to the ideal condition. That's not surprising, right? Mm -hmm. So the ideal, so we're not hitting the ideal, but, but, and there's maybe the suggestion with more sludge, uh, again, not significant, maybe the suggestion with more sludge, uh, less performance of the plants. Mm -hmm. but, um, but if we talk about dry site, there's, there's no difference at all. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I didn't mention the first hypothesis. The first hypothesis, um, basically there was no gross toxicity. Out of the 200 whatever odd, odd plants, I think it was four or five died all told. And there wasn't any pattern. There were both species, there wasn't anything. So, so there wasn't any clear toxicity, right? And this went for 15 months. There wasn't, so these things weren't getting poisoned. That was the first question, so not poisoned. This is the next question, hey, are they, do they benefit? Clearly they don't benefit relative to the ideal soil, but they're all growing, right? They all are all growing. And then there's this question of what's the optimal mix, right? And that's what we were just, we're hashing right there. So that's salicornia. Here's Frankenia, the other dominant species. Again, same, same uh, layout of the graph. The darker color is the dry sites. The, the brighter color is the site that is wetter. And again, in general, the wetland soil has higher performance. Um, I, I, I didn't mention before, but, but Gesundheit, there was no significant or, or very little significant effect of the um, uh, pot. So the pot itself, the, the, the treatment was, uh, generally speaking, not a problem. So we weren't getting way artificial results by using these little pots. Um, so that's, that's good. And then again, with the sludge, maybe there's a suggestion of um, a pattern, but nothing significant there. And, uh, and in this case, uh, this case, dry site was really most similar to each other. Frankenia, the wet site was generally speaking most similar to each other. So no, no, clear, no clear winners in terms of which concentration. But armed with this, armed with this, we were allowed to go to the next phase. This is the next phase. This is called the pilot experiment. And, um, and so this was going and doing our first real construction. This would be the first real restoration experiment per se. Um, that, that, uh, that first phase is almost like a pre-restoration experiment, you could call it. So we do this. And this is what we did. So this is the diagram of, of my experiment. So this is the outer wall. This is the outer wall of that, um, of the ponds. So the plan was to delete this. So to take out this wall, to construct a tidal creek in here. So there was a tidal creek that was just outside, connect to that tidal creek, go in here. Um, now recall it's all sewage sludge. So again, the, the regulators were concerned, right? So what we had to do before we, before this is the last step, the last step was to take the wall down. First step was to scoop out all of this sludge and actually pile it over here. So we had to remove all of the potentially toxic stuff go to the upland area, which was closer to PCH, dig up that area, which wasn't jurisdictional wetland, take that sediment, bring that sediment in, and fill in all this beige area, right? So we're putting in, we're starting with clean soil, clean soil. And then, and then uh, take the, this berm essentially and put and connect and make a new berm right here. So we, so still all the other cells, which are over here, are cut off from the salt marsh. Only this one little cell here is now connected to the salt marsh. By constructing a tidal creek, that allows us to have tidal connectivity, but also during the periods of really, really high tide, when the water level is high throughout the marsh and the marsh is flooded, this will allow surface flow in here, sheet flow from the marsh plain into the area. Everybody with me? So then those blue things, are our experimental treatments. Now, instead of doing them in a little one gallon pot, we're doing these in uh, three meter by three meter plots that go down about, <coughs> about a half meter. So we've, we, after we make all this clean soil, we cut out 
and we use those plots as experimental soil. So then we can fill in the soil in each of these little uh, areas. And then what I'm showing you here is the um, black is, is wetland soil from outside, the ideal soil, right, the, 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 the best possible performance. And then the blue and the, and the, blue and the dark brown um, are representing sludge mixed with some matrix. The, the brown is the, is the soil from the upland, the clean soil from the upland. The blue is that clay layer. So remember I mentioned we had that clay beneath? We actually saved some of that clay. And so we mixed that clay with the sludge or the upland soil with the sludge. And then the amount of sludge in the particular mixture is shown by the number inside. So what we see here is we have replicates of treatments. It's a little hard to see from this diagram. Is So here's that tidal creek. This is very precisely engineered to go from relatively sh shallow to relatively high elevation. Relatively shallow here to relatively high elevation. So this is essentially a very, very subtle valley and in the middle is the tidal creek. The idea there is that the elevational or the inundation exposure of this row is equal to this row. The inundation, eleva the, in the elevation of this row is identical to this. So they're designed to be mirror images of each other. So we had replicates. Yeah, Hayden. How long did it take you to set up this entire? It took a long time. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about the actual logistics of it in a second. But it took, this was several years because of, uh, I'll tell you about what happens again. So, so, so here you go. So here, here are the different matrices of the, the, the um, sediments that went into making our mixes. And so we had this you know, clay layer, and then we had different wetlands and berms, et cetera. And what you see is the sludge, and this is sand, silt, and clay. Remember, sand is the relatively large grain fraction of the sediment. Clay is the finest uh, particle size. Um, these guys, the wetland sites, you know, there's of course a decent amount of sand, but there's, there's a good proportion of silt and clay, right? The clay layer, quote unquote, from underneath was, you know, similar to that, but the sludge and the surrounding berm were way, 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 way over enriched with sand. They're very coarse grain. And again, this is the typical size distribution that people were using at the time in salt marsh restorations in California. So clearly, we could use the sludge, but in addition to just any whatever is going on with the sludge in terms of toxicity, whatever, by using the sludge, we're having a lot of sand. We're making the, the soil a lot less clayey, a lot less silty. Cool? Okay, the question about how do we do this? This was a huge, this was, this was an amazing opportunity for me. My professors were busy folks, as you guys know I am, and, and some of you guys are following in my footsteps in this, in this role, which is the professors sort of had the projects, get the money, this and that. They're usually too busy to go out and do the work, as you guys know from my projects, right? I send you out to go do the mapping with the drones and the this and the that, right? So in this case, though, this was an incredible opportunity because I got to be in the driver's seat, essentially, for the restoration construction. That would never happen, or, or that's very, very rare, right? Typically, that's something a senior project manager would do and this and that. So it was a great experience for me. This was on the military base. The military guys said, hey, this is great. We have Naval Construction Battalion, CBs here. Hey, this is great. We'll, we'll teach our, our young guys how to work in the marsh. Right, because Navy guys might need to do that, right? If there was a war or a disaster relief, something like that. But what that meant was they gave us their 18-year-old guys oh. that had never <laughs> driven a tractor before, by and large, oh, no. right? And so they looked upon this as a training opportunity. We've talked before about the importance of, you know, spend more money, get the expert excavator, you know, driver, whoever it is, because it's way, you know, it's way, way better. This is one of the reasons I say that. So we started doing this. So have a look. So here is, here is uh, the area we've cleared it, right? And so you can see how nice and flat it is, right? We're in one of this, the, the pilot restoration here. What you can't tell from this picture, perhaps, this is an excavator. This is called the D6. This is a very, very, very large 
bulldozer. You can't see it very well because the mud is just about, or the, the, the sediment is just about up to the cabin. This giant, massive piece of machinery is sinking into the marsh. Because oh. a kid was driving it and he started to spin the treads and he didn't know how to behave and he, it just, he just started spinning. And this is a wetland, remember? And it just started sinking and sinking and sinking. And this isn't, and, and this is often the case with restoration. It's not like, hey, it's called tri AAA. And remember I told you that, that guy at Stanford that went and, you know, that we were lucky, we're next to the road. You know, what do you do here? How do you get a tractor out of the middle of a marsh? Right? So they're throwing boulders in there and like, whoa, 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 this is my experiment. Throw boulders in there, see if you can drive on the boulder. It was a huge problem. So we finally ultimately had to put down special stuff so that the so that the excavator could go in the middle. And the excavator basically dug out an area, made a ramp, and, and took this guy out. So that was a huge problem. So that we're almost done. And then we essentially deleted the whole or large chunk of the experiment. And then it started raining. Oh. Oh. So then we were done for the year. So we lost a whole year. Right? When we're building our campus, when we're building our campus parking lots, who do we use? CBs. Why? Because they'll do it for free, just materials. And campus, we're so poor. Hey, let's have those guys do it, right? And those guys aren't ill-intentioned. They're not stupid or bad. But it's, are you going to put your top, you know, your top engineer on this project? No, you're going to give these kind of projects, which are viewed as, as lame stuff, unimportant, low priority. You're going to give it to your new guys so they can get training. Right? Now, if you're doing a parking lot here on campus, that's not a big deal. It's flat. Right? So we screwed up and it's an inch or two too high. Who cares? But in this context, it makes a huge difference. So that we lost an entire year. All the effort, all the money, all the time, we had to come back and redo it. That's one, that's one example of logistical challenges we have during restoration. Another is this thing on the left. So on the left, what we're doing is we're making the mixtures for the plots. I'm going to put it in the plots, okay? So we're taking literally, and, and you know, th this is large volume of soils. I just showed you 50%, right? How the hell do you get 50%? Well, you have two piles of your material, and you scoop up pile one, dump it in this big giant hopper. This is, this is basically a big semi truck. Dump it in the hopper. Grab the other pile, dump it in there, right? This is an industrial mixer. This particular soil mixer is generally used at toxic sites that um, people need to mitigate for the soil and all this and that, so it's very expensive. Also, it runs on its own generator. Also, it is old technology. Also, it was, at the time, a big problem for the air quality uh, management district. Almost all of these counties around California had essentially grandfathered this type of, of engine and emission out. It was basically a dirty diesel engine, essentially, is what it was. And there, there's only like a handful of these in the state. There's like six or something like that. So this was expensive. This was on the order of, I don't remember, $10,000 a day or whatever it was costing us to have this hopper there. And so just, just for finishing, once we would do that and we'd run the material through and we'd get it blended, we'd scoop it up again and run it through one more time. So we'd have it homogenized. Um, but essentially we'd do that. This little loader, whatever it was, this little loader would pick up the stuff that came out, drive it over and dump it into my plot and, and we'd, we'd work our way around. We're in the midst of, we're just starting this, right? Starting this, starting this, starting this. And this guy walks out with a hard hat, white hard hat, safety guy. So I'm out there, and he goes, hey, yeah, how's it going? Talks all nice for 10, 15 minutes, chatting, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So, um, yeah, so what are you guys doing here? Oh, you know, we're, we're, you know, blah, 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 trying to restore this wetland, this and that. Huh, yeah, well, um, you have to turn that thing off. What's that? You have to turn off that hopper. Why? It's not permitted in Ventura County. Ventura County and one other county in California were the places it wasn't allowed. Not allowed to do it here. Wow. Oh, yeah, well, we've already done all the contracting. I only need about like three more days. Yeah, sorry. Turn it off now, in the middle of the day. Uh, wait, what? So $10,000 a day we're paying for it, regardless if it's working or not working, right? 
So that lost about, about five days of just people calling people and they find it, okay, you guys can use it. And then fire back up. So a few months later, this, they, they, they eliminate that, that concern and now it, and it was okay to be used. But it's that level of problematic stuff that you have to deal with when you're doing these restorations. So, so the logistics of actually working in a wetland, non-trivial, dangerous potentially. Secondly, this issue of, of overlapping jurisdictions, right? So when people talk about the incredible um, bureaucracy in California, it's totally real. It's so real that it impacts even the things you might think shouldn't be impacted. And so we do need to get a handle on some of these crazy um, rules. I don't want to go down that road. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So this is what it looks like when we're putting the plots in again. So here is the area that's all been contoured. Here's the middle where the, where the tidal creek's going to go. And here you see the excavator coming in, getting ready to dig out these very precisely um, machined plots. And this is going to be concentration one, concentration two, et cetera. Uh, we laid them out with two by fours so the guys would know exactly how big to cut them. And then, and there you go. You guys see how we do it. This was right after we connected flow. So again, here we, this is a new berm that's built up. We've taken down this berm. So now we have sheet flow with the marsh and our restoration experiment. And this is the first time the tidal creek is starting to flood. And you can see what's happened in this case, the whole creek is starting to flood and now the tide is going up. So it's just starting to spill over the, the lip and then gonna start to flood. Um, now this was muddy area and we were gonna be monitoring this a lot. And so we established these trestles these are made out of treks, and we knocked, built, knocked these into the uh, mud, and then we had uh, planks that we would lay on the, here, either lay on the ground or actually lay on here, so we could walk out without having to disturb the marsh surface and or hurt the plants and what have you. So great, it was a young person's task because we had to carry these planks all over the place and they were really heavy, but, um, but that's how we did it. That's why I supervise you guys now doing your things. <laughs> and the old fat guy drinks his, uh, drinks his soda and watches you guys do it. Okay, so this is, this is what we found. So here's an example of one of our plots, right? So we only put plants in our plots. In this case, since they're bigger than uh, the little pot, we could do much more plant, much more individuals, not just one individual in that whole big plot, right? And so this is an example after a, uh, about a year and a half, two years of some of the growth. So this plot you can see is doing really, really well. We use my laser, the laser vegetation counter that uh, I invented that some of you guys might have used as our, as our measure of plant cover. But here we go. So we have um, Salicornia, Frankenia, and Mononthe Chloe. Uh, again, three common species there. Uh, each in one quadrant of the plot. And then in a third quadrant, we planted all these species and more. So we had a diversity planting and then we had individual monocultures to see how things would perform. And this is what we see. So here we go, let's look over here. This is again, sludge concentration. The lighter color is the upland or the, the terrestrial soil. The darker color is uh, the matrix is the clay, is that, that clay rich layer. And then here's the concentration of sludge. Everybody with me? And then again, gray is just the, the wetland control, the ideal stuff. So Mananthe Chloe, Frankenia, and Salicornia. And this is the percent cover, mean, and standard error looking straight down onto that quadrant of the plot. Um, so what do, what do you guys see? What do you take away from that, that my experiment? Salicornia, yeah, right, so, so Salicornia is one of the community dominants. So it grew a lot, it, it dominated a lot, cool. What about, how, 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 did they, how did our plots do compared to the wetland? As, be, as good or better, in most cases, not statistically significantly different from the wetland, which is awesome, <laughs> right? Okay, so that's that. Uh, now, we couldn't look at, direct mortality in this case because you know it's a bunch of plants and so if one died in the middle you wouldn't really be able to see that but there was no major die-off there was no big brown spots or, or or canopy openings generally speaking and so so that's okay now what about the I ideal concentration what's the ideal concentration 50 why why do you say 50 
With very few exceptions, there's no significant effect of the sludge concentration. The bigger effect is the dark, and, it, and the, this isn't always significant, but when they're, but the trend is the darker color, right? The, the, the bar on the left, excuse me, the left is generally speaking higher performance than the one on the right. Not, not necessarily significantly different, but that's the trend. That, that's the only consistent trend. There isn't a consistent, things always do better with more sludge or always do better with less sludge. That seems to be the pattern. So the soil matrix seems to be more important than, than just the, um, than the, the sludge itself. Everybody with me? Okay, so that allows us to go to the full restoration. So the full restoration was, hey, let's mix this sludge in place with that, homogenize it with the clay layer underneath, and essentially make what would be about a 25%, what, uh, uh, take that back. It would make about, it would make about this constant, about this concentration, about 75% concentration of uh, sludge with the, with the underlying, so mix it in place. Essentially get some big, giant, kind of like we unintentionally did with the excavator, right? Go down and, and mix it all up, homogenize it in place. And we can allow, oh, I, 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 didn't, I don't show you this here, but also we did a bunch of other stuff. Collected a bunch of serothidia, mud snails, a bunch of crabs, caught fish, and looked at the metal co metals concentration in those tissues. Similarly, we did the same thing with, plant, with the, the plants. I'm not showing you that, but we actually analyzed the, the plants that were samples of the plants that were growing the plots and plants that were just outside. And this little, we, we made a basin here, a, a deeper excavation in the creek to, to catch just erosion in general, any sediments, because this is all naked soil, right? Catch that stuff that, that came off, that ran off, and, uh, and entrap it. And so we also sampled that sediment as well, which is most likely to have the mobilized soil from in there. Nothing, nothing was, was particularly problematic. We, we saw no problematic tissues of animals, no problematic accumulation in plant thalli, et cetera. So that's good. So that, th that plus the, combined with the results of our experiment, gave us the green light to start doing the full-scale restoration, which was actually to do the entirety or, or the vast majority of the pond. Did you do the 75% mixture because you were, so you wouldn't have to bring as much... Outside. Because just mixing it right there, because because there wasn't that much clay at the bottom, so the so the amount of clay and the amount of sludge overlying it, it was basically with the seventy five percent, roughly, roughly was. I think it was closer to seventy, but okay. We measure all these things. We measured measured snail demography and parasites and seed banks and all that jazz. And again, like we talked about before, here's our here's our conceptual uh, framework. We're trying to go from uh, from the red level of functioning up to the green, but in reality we're in the orange somewhere. So Sarathidia, you guys know all this, um, and you've seen this data before. This is a subsection of the data that I that I showed you before. But basically, this just to sh just to show you. So the green is uh, the reference sites outside the restoration. Orange is our Magoo restoration. So this may make more sense to you now when you see what we actually did. So when we first started, when we first started the restoration, there were no snails inside the marsh, in, inside our pilot restoration. They just hadn't come yet. So we couldn't even assess that. But then when they started to come in, they were had a lower level of trematode diversity. So, so trophic complexity in the system was not as great as the area outside of the restoration but then by year two and a half there was no significant difference so we achieved functional equivalency at least in terms of trematode slash trophic complexity um, within uh, three years and then uh, here's another piece of data that's, rela that's related to this but you guys haven't seen this before so this is um, this is a uh, particular um, uh, parasite that uses um, big birds, uses, uses um, I think it's great blue heron, I can't remember, but it's either great blue heron or egret, I, one of those two. So here we go. So here's, here's uh, our uh, restoration, and here's the natural marsh. So what this is saying is that we didn't, we started off and we didn't, uh, what year is this? This is probably year, hmm, can't remember, this is probably 1999. 
But this is, uh, so this is saying is, is Magoo, uh, the restoration here, this is the pond, the pilot restoration is what I'm showing you here. The pilot restoration doesn't have the same number of birds using it, right? So this is, the, this is essentially the intensity of the bird use. And uh, so while we have the trophic complexity, the birds are still in the process of coming in. Um, right, so same thing, yeah, so, so this is initial, early on, uh, ha about half the trematodes in the restoration versus the natural site, um, but the, the density of the snails was actually, in our restoration, more, it was greater than the natural marsh. So by, it, it depends on the metric, right? So the trematode richness appears to be much more sensitive than just the gross, do we have these critters here or not, and how many of those critters are there? This is what the site looks like today. This is when we were doing a little experiment out there a few years ago. But so this is, this was, this was that place we took down. We erased the berm there. So this, you, see, you see the remnant berm wall here and here. I'm standing on the berm. Here's that tidal creek. Here are all my old plots. You can't even see where they are, right? The plants have just grown up and they're doing their own dew and, and, and there's no, if you were to walk out there today, you could not tell um, that we'd done anything in terms of plants. What you'll also see is now this berm, the temporary berm that we built has been taken down. And uh, the yellow things are one of our experiments that are going on out there. But um, what you see is uh, uh, the Tidal Creek is connected and all this function is going on. It's, we've achieved um, a, a pretty well-functioning, healthy marsh. Now, it's not all intact. So here we go. So th this was the pilot restoration. So that picture was just looking this way. Here you see the old Tidal Creek we constructed. Very linear, right? Because it had to be really straight because we were trying to control the elevations and be all precise and everything. Here's the old Tidal Creek. Tidal Creek actually still goes up over here, but now a much larger stem is all, look at that sinuosity, right? So that was partly dug that way, but also it's been evolving on its own. So you see these little head cuts are starting to form, head cuts, head cuts, head cuts, head cuts. Um, this is still there. So there's still a small section. This pipe is still live. And what's going on here is um, this is an emergency overflow pond. So sometimes we have a lot of you know, rain. Our sewage system might get, might get backed up so that we don't allow the sewage to flow up into someone's uh, house or toilet or whatever. What we do is this is considered an emergency overflow pond. So this is a brand new pond. It's built in the corner of the old pond. And uh, it's lined now with an impervious, impervious membrane, which is what you want, a really thick rubber plastic thing. And now if there's a problem, they can flood this with sewage temporarily. And then you know, in a couple hours the next day, whenever the, whenever the pipes are clean, they can pump this out and this will go to the treatment plant. So this is an important um, uh, <clears throat> uh, logistics part of the sewage system. We've also left this berm in place, right? This outer berm in place, so that um, the the tidal creek, the Cayugas Creek, won't cut into it. And so, by having the pond here, that assures us that the Navy is going to maintain this and keep this berm here, right? They need that. So it's sort of a, a it serves multiple purposes. But look, we've gotten all this functioning wetland out of this area that otherwise would have been a pit in the ground, right? Is that ideal? What, do I wish there'd be no walls at all? Yeah, sure. But given the fiscal constraints and other things, that's a, I would argue that's a pretty good success. Without the phased approach to restoration, we would not have been allowed to do that. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, oh, okay. So. I didn't do this part of stuff. We've been doing some monitoring out there, but I don't, I don't, I didn't do that thing. Why? 9-11 happened. And I went up to Stanford for my postdoc. So 9-11 happened. We were not allowed on the base for six months, purely for security concerns and terrorism worries and all this and that. So, uh, so this next phase was done essentially by a contractor. The Navy hired to just go and do it. So it looks like they did a good job of it, but we, uh, unfortunately, because of unique historical circumstances, 
I, I don't, I'm not actively involved with the continued restoration of this particular site. Um, and, and, you know, that happens and, and things happen. But the, the point is, we laid such a good groundwork with our data and our, and our monitoring that that allowed the Navy to get sort of just a Joe Blow contractor to come on in and do it. Cool? All right, so that's one example.